medcram.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another MedCram video. We're going to talk today about bleeding in cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is an end-stage liver condition. It can be caused by a number of things. Anything that causes inflammation in the liver, like hepatitis, can also be caused by alcohol, and even what we call non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or fatty liver. And what I want to talk to you about is specifically how we might manage bleeding in cirrhosis in a particular situation that I was recently introduced to by taking care of a patient in the intensive care unit. In that case, I had a particular problem and I had to do some searching and I found this reference on the internet called the Internet Book of Critical Care, the IBCC. This is actually a subset of the mcrit.org and I'll actually put a link in the description below. Pretty interesting discussion, and I'll go over what it was that I got out of this. So in this particular case, there was a young gentleman who had alcoholic cirrhosis, and he was drinking and was going into alcohol withdrawal because he had stopped drinking just a few days earlier. Unfortunately, his liver disease was pretty advanced, and he developed ascites. Ascites is where you, below the diaphragm, start developing the egress of fluid out of the liver, out of the tissues, and it causes a collection of fluid basically in the abdomen, and the abdomen becomes distended. In this particular case, the fluid started to go north of the diaphragm and was actually involving the lung, causing the lungs to become collapsed. So not only did he have ascites, he also had a pleural effusion. And it was a pretty large one at that, to the point where he actually required ventilation. In other words, he was intubated and put on the ventilator. And so part of the workup of this type of situation is you need to make sure that the ascites fluid here is not infected. And that requires us to take a needle and to put it into that pocket of fluid using an ultrasound machine to make sure you direct it appropriately to take off some of that fluid and to send it off to the laboratory to make sure that it gets looked at. It also helps to drain off that fluid completely. And if there is a connection between the abdominal collection of fluid and the pleural effusion, then you can actually relieve some of that fluid around the lung and improve the patient's breathing ability. So that was all of the benefits of doing this paracentesis, is what it's called, a paracentesis. But there's always risks of doing a paracentesis. And the risks that are often involved is bleeding and causing infection causing a scar, etc. And the reason why there is a chance of bleeding is if you were to look at the abdominal wall, so here's the skin on the surface, there are blood vessels that run through the abdominal wall. And even though you might have the best of intentions, it's possible when you put the needle in that you could nick an artery, or even more subtle would be if there is veins that are running through there that you might hit. When the liver becomes cirrhotic, and we'll draw the liver right here, Blood is supposed to come up from the abdomen and go through the liver and up to the heart, which is right here. Unfortunately, in cirrhosis, the liver becomes almost impassable. And what happens, just like when there is an accident on the freeway, cars get off onto the surface streets and try to find alternative ways. So sometimes you can have esophageal varices where the veins become distended. Sometimes you can have the bypasses on the abdominal wall. Other places include hemorrhoids. There's also an area there around in the spleen, but sometimes these vessels in the abdominal area can become engorged, enlarged, and the pressure can be high in these. And so when you're putting a needle in to the abdomen to try to get fluid out, it's possible that you could nick these as well. And then you finally go through, and that's where the fluid is, and you can drain it out. Most of the time that goes without a problem. Well, on this occasion, we did put the needle in and we found it to be fine. We were able to take fluid out without a problem. But the next day, we noted that the patient's hemoglobin had dropped by about two points. And that was significant. So it went from about seven down to five. And of course, he was transfused back up to seven. And then it started to drop again down to six, transfused another unit, and we repeated it, and it was still at six. So that told us that there was definitely some bleeding. So we took the ultrasound machine, did not look as a very nice abdominal wall, but it was kind of enlarged. And all we saw is that there were pockets and that was likely the fact that there was probably some coagulated blood. In other words, the patient was probably bleeding 
from the procedure. And of course, this is a known risk. It's something that can happen, and there's sometimes very little that you can do about it. So what we needed to do at that point is to stop bleeding. And let's talk a little bit about how we stop bleeding in liver disease. For some of you out there who are familiar with things like the INR, plasma, things of that nature, don't think there's nothing to learn because I actually learned something here about this that actually saved this patient in terms of bleeding. And it has to do with a entity that's known as accelerated intravascular coagulation and fibrinolysis. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on in this patient. First of all, let's draw our blood vessel. And what we want to have is a blood clot to stop this blood vessel from bleeding. And there are a number of things that can help you with this. So first one is, of course, plasma. Plasma is going to help give you a blood clot. Plasma comes from outside of the blood vessel system where you have the liver, which I'll draw right here, that is made by vitamin K, which causes the vitamin K-dependent factors to produce plasma. And the way we measure whether or not we're doing a good job is something called the INR. And we really want that to be less than 1.5. Once it starts getting up to about 2, that means there's not enough plasma and blood clots are not going to happen. The other thing that you want to make sure that you have are platelets. Platelets are also going to contribute to blood clots because the platelets are going to be that first foundational layer that's going to allow the blood clot to form on it. There's one other ingredient. It's not the only one, but it's a major one, and that is fibrinogen. The three ingredients that we're going to talk about are plasma, platelets, and fibrinogen. The problem, though, is if that's all we had, then we would have blood clots in our blood vessels all the time. And so what happens is that there is a chemical called TPA that is secreted from the endothelium or the inner covering of the artery, and that causes or stimulates this blood clot to be turned into a dissolved blood clot. And you can actually pick that up by doing a blood test called the D-dimer test. If you order a D-dimer and you see that the D-dimer is elevated, there are probably products of clot breakdown. Now this is important because it's a balance, right? So TPA is being secreted by the endothelium to make sure that blood doesn't stagnate and coagulate in the middle. But on the other hand, if there's damage, the body can also use plasma, platelets, and fibrinogen to make blood clots. But TPA can actually break down the blood clot. So that's really important to understand. So what happened in our patient with liver issues? It shows here that the vitamin K in the liver causes there to be plasma, which of course is important, but the liver is also responsible for breaking down TPA, for making sure that TPA doesn't build up and increase in concentration so much that it breaks down all of the blood clots. If your liver is not working, TPA might hang around more. And if TPA hangs around more often, it's going to do a better job of breaking down blood clots, not only the bad ones, but also the good ones. And as clots continue to form and be broken down, this process, known as accelerated intravascular coagulation and fibrinolysis, what happens is, is that the fibrinogen, which is responsible for making the blood clots, starts to decrease in terms of its amount because of this short circuiting. So as the blood clots are being formed and then broken down and then formed and broken down, you're going to be using up starting material and you're going to notice that your fibrinogen levels take a big drop. And so this is exactly what was happening in our case. This patient with liver failure was not breaking down TPA. So TPA levels were going up and starting to break down the blood clots, despite the fact that we had given plasma in this patient, and despite the fact that we had enough platelets in this patient, because TPA was not being appropriately metabolized by the liver because the patient had liver cirrhosis, blood clots were being broken down and this patient continued to bleed. So what I ordered was a fibrinogen level. Some people would say that it should not be less than 100. In this case, it was 77. So I knew that we were likely in accelerated intravascular coagulation and fibrinolysis because the amount of fibrinogen was being used up and that's why it was low. So the first thing that I did was I transfused one pack of something called cryoprecipitate. Cryoprecipitate is a blood product that is high in fibrinogen. 
But you can see here that that doesn't solve the problem completely. Yes, it does replenish the fibrinogen that's being used up, but the real problem is right here. It's the fact that TPA is not being metabolized by the liver and it's continuing to dissolve these blood clots. And so what we really needed here was a medication that would shut down or block TPA from doing its dirty work. And there are two potential possibilities. One is known as tranexamic acid and the other one is known as aminocaproic acid. Both of these are substances which indeed block TPA from doing its work. And I can tell you in this case that as soon as I gave one gram of tranexamic acid that was preceded by a unit of cryoprecipitate, the bleeding immediately stopped. We no longer had to give blood transfusions. The patient's blood pressure came up. We thereafter started a drip of tranexamic acid to make sure and followed the fibrinogen levels. And those fibrinogen levels actually stayed well around 150 and did not come down, despite the fact that we were not replacing any more fibrinogen afterwards. I want to show you the article that was published in 2021 by Josh Farkas. It actually goes over many different pearls and considerations that you have in cirrhosis when you are trying to stop a hemorrhage or bleeding. It talks about platelets, for instance. It also talks about the significance of the INR in liver failure. But he also talks about the importance of fibrinolysis and this clot degradation. So essentially what was happening in our patient is the patient was trying to clot, but the high amounts of TPA that were circulating because of liver disease was not allowing those clots to stay active. Here you can see in this graph that as tranexamic acid infusion was started, the D-dimer levels came down dramatically. That's, again, a sign that there is destruction of clots. That the green line, which is the fibrinogen level, started to come up and hold very nicely and stably. That these blue lines are the amount of blood that had to be given. You can see as soon as the tranexamic acid was given in this case, no more blood transfusions were necessary. And so the moral of the story here is that if you have a cirrhotic patient that has an elevated INR and you are replacing it, consider the possibility, if there is bleeding, that the patient may have this accelerated intravascular coagulation and fibrinolysis. Go ahead and get a fibrinogen level. And if it is low, then you should suspect that this could be happening and you can take appropriate action. So there are side effects with tranexamic acid and amiocaproic acid. Specifically with tranexamic acid, there is a risk of seizure. You can look those details up, and I'll put a link to this article in the description below. Once again, the treatment of accelerated intravascular coagulation and fibrinolysis, number one, is restoration of fibrinogen levels. That's using cryoprecipitate. And number two, the addition of tranexamic acid or aminocaproic acid, and that is a fibrinolysis inhibitor. And they have listed there a few more details about the practical aspects. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe, turn on notifications. Join us at medcram.com where we have videos, lectures, and explanations on liver pathophysiology with excellent reviews and also free enrollment. I hope this has been helpful. It certainly has helped me think outside the box when it comes to my patients with liver disease and bleeding and coagulopathy. There may be also something else going on which is involving a completely different arm of the coagulation system. Thanks for joining us.